All right, so we had the richest horse race in the world this past Saturday over in Saudi Arabia, the $20 million Saudi Cup. We talked a little bit about it with Tinky on yesterday's show or earlier this week's show. I don't know why this is airing. The previous show, the last show before this one, we discussed it with Tinky, but I wanted to you know, break it down a little bit with John specifically about the result because Senor Buscador is, I'm a big fan of his. I mentioned the story I did on him uh, from TDN back in 2020, uh, how he was basically the net, he, Joe Peacock and his father bred Senor Buscador. It was the last horse that they bred together before Joe Senior died. And they're a small breeding operation with basically one superstar mare named Rose's Desert. And if you haven't read the story, Rose's Desert was an absolute terror on the track in New Mexico. She won 10 out of 15 races. She was second in her other five. She was never beaten more than a length and a quarter in her entire career. And she was actually had some sneaky good breeding as well. So then when they went, when she was retired, the Peacocks, who primarily race in New Mexico, said, mm, we got to send her to Kentucky. She is so great for us. We got to give her a shot to be a star broodmare. And so that's what they did. They sent her to Kentucky. They bred her to a lot of real, you know, strong commercial stallions. And she's had five stakes winners. She might have more now. But when I wrote the story, she had five stakes winners from five horses to race, which is just amazing. And Senior Buscador is by Mineshaft, who we are also big fans of. And he just he he just kept coming down that long stretch in the Saudi Cup, and he he's also one of these horses that yeah you know, I think a lot of people were were happy for not just because of the small connections, but because he just ran four weeks earlier in or was it maybe it was three weeks earlier no, four, four, four three weeks or four, weeks, er, four yeah. weeks earlier in the Pegasus shipped all the way across the world to run in the Saudi Cup and came right back with another huge effort after running second in the Pegasus to win the Saudi Cup. So for all those people who think that you need five months between races for top horses, no. If you got a hardy horse and you're training them the right way, they can show up time after time. And he was just an easy, easy horse to root for. Just held off Ushba Tesoro. Saudi Crown, I thought, ran a huge, 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 race, huge race to be third in there after setting that fast pace. But, you know... I was kind of happy a horse named Saudi Crown did not win the Saudi Cup because that whole event makes me a little nauseous. John, your thoughts. I, I was just happy to see a horse like Senor Buscador hit the wire first. And and just the fact that the industry that is full of of history and blue bloods and 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 keeping people out, um, excluding them. It, the fact that it, the entire industry really has embraced the, their program, the Senior Buscador team and and the trainer and the owners and and like you said, small breeding operation. Um, it, it's good for racing. It's a good story. And not that I want to compare it to like a Cody's Wish or anything like that, because it's not the same, you know, human element. But it's just a wonderful story that, you know, the, the team with the deepest pockets doesn't always win. And and, you know, as I've learned meritocracy, um, that's a really important um, feature of our industry is the fact that it's not just the richest people. It's not just the biggest programs. It's not just the, um, you know, the, 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 the deeper pockets. Occasionally, not even occasionally, you can come up with a horse like this, um, that jumps up and, and now is a top of the, the racing industry. And, and Joe, what I thought was interesting also is the horse, Junior Buscador, you know, broke through kind of a, his own glass ceiling because prior to that, he had been knocking around and, and won a couple of grade threes and won a couple of listed races um, and even won the San Diego handicap in, in last year in 23, but had never really broken through until these last two races in a grade one um, at a grade one environment. And the Pegasus ran a good second. And then, you know, Scott Hazelton, who was who was on the air for, uh, you know, for for FanDuel, I thought had a very, very funny line, which is, um, it, you know, the stretch run at, at the uh, the Saudi Cup is 15 miles long and it took all 15 miles to get that horse up. And I thought that was just a great line um, and an organic line that, that he came up with because it was it's a super long stretch. And it just seemed like that it went on forever and ever and ever. But Senor Buscador just got up. Uh, you, you could when I watched the race, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if he got up in the end. Junior Alvarado obviously definitely thought that he got up at the end because um, he was celebrating as soon as they hit the wire. But it, it, it's good for racing again to have a story like this and have this be the lead. Instead of some of the ugly stories that we've been fighting over the past uh, couple of years. Yeah, and I'm happy for Junior Alvarado too. He's a very underrated writer, nice guy, has had a lot of injuries over his career. Uh, he's had to bounce back from, um, but he's just, he's just one of those guys that o always gives you a hundred percent, you know, saves ground is just I, one of those. He's, I, you know, 
top 10 jockey to me in terms of talent, but he doesn't get that recognition. So I was happy to see him win a big time race because he's the kind of guy that I think a lot of trainers would take off of a horse if they have a big race coming up and try to find, you know, Irad or, or Jose or, or one of those, you know, real big name guys. So, so good for junior, good for Todd Fincher. And we might have him on the show at some point. He's pointing to the Dubai world cup, I believe. So he's going to run right back. And then, you know, there were other, there were other races on the card. I, the card kind of bores me in general, just cause you're a know, snob. Man. That's like, why you're a snob. I'm, not a, I'm a snob. I'm a snob because <laughs> Listen, the Saudis could have made that a hundred million dollar race and still not felt it at all. Right. It's just that kind of car where it's just it's 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 completely inorganic to me. They popped this racetrack up in the desert out of nowhere and just threw a bajillion dollars at it. And it's like we already ha- we already had that in the Dubai World Cup, and now you have another race that's basically subsuming the entire North American handicap calendar in the first half of the year. We talked about that with with Tinky the other day, and yeah, it just I, I, it, it doesn't move me. But there was one other interesting race, one other interesting uh, American related result, uh, which was was it the Saudi Derby and Bookham Dano. The mile, oh, the mile race, yeah, with the Jersey bread, Bookham Dano. Yeah, I mean, why don't you why don't you talk a little bit about that, John? Because I, I know you were really interested in that result. Well, Bookham Dano is, is trained by Derek Ryan, who who was you know years ago an exercise rider, um, and has slowly worked his way up and and has built a, a really solid program. And the rumor had it that if it wasn't for this horse, um, that he may have given up training because he just it was so hard to try to attract new owners and 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 horses. And, uh, and, and this horse, Bookham Dano, is a Jersey bred, modestly bred and super sprinter. All he's been doing is winning, you know, going one turn and for a little while was on the Derby campaign. But ultimately, they decided, you know, this horse just doesn't seem like he's going to be able to go the, the classic distances in the two turns. So they they pivoted and and went for the money, which I think is great. And the horse ran a really good second to Forever Young, who I think now is got to be one of the top 15 candidates for the Kentucky Derby based on on that race and based on the fact that he's still undefeated. Um, and, and you know, who knows what his competition was in Japan, but he's undefeated. He's beaten some some decent horses. Now he's beaten some American horses. And Joe, I wouldn't be surprised if not only Forever Young comes here, but, you know, this might be the year that an international horse wins the Derby, especially because it's going to be a little bit of a watered down field without the Baffert horses. Yeah. And it's going to happen eventually, you know, and it, but it's, it's, it hasn't been a, a successful path to the Derby thus far w- running in Dubai or running in the, these Saudi races. So yeah, I mean, eventually that, that streak will be broken, but yeah, it was a tough beat for Derek Ryan and Irad and, and book him Dano because he had that open lead. He had the open length lead in the stretch. And I thought, you know, not an expert on jockeys. I thought Irad should have switched sticks at some point. I just thought he wasn't really responding to, to the lefty whip, but I think a lot of, a lot of U.S. jockeys are a little spooked. They're mm-hmm. using the whip too much, and right. that because of what happened, like with Mike Smith, I think it was, where he he got he lost the the purse for the Midnight Bisu race because he went a couple of strikes over. Um, but that was that was just my sense from that race. But you know, listen, this it, it's it's great to have. I think American trainers take shots like that. Mm-hmm. Even if I'm not a fan of the of the Saudi Cup card as a whole, like it's I like when American trainers step outside the box and are rewarded. That's why everybody everybody makes fun of Kenny McPeak because he like sends horses to Royal Ascot and and you know steps them up in these spots that they don't necessarily always make sense. I'm never going to be the guy to trash people for stepping outside the box and trying something different and creating a more you know, a connected world of racing, you know, because that's what the Japanese are doing. They've shipped all over and they've made themselves a force in American racing and Saudi racing, in some cases in European racing or Australian racing, because they're not afraid to say, hey, our, we think our horses could compete with your best horses. Let's see them settle it on the racetrack. That's what racing ultimately is all about and why it was created. 